insects while I was paying attention to wildflowers. Uh, I started out being interested in botany and then became really interested in the bees and flies that I was seeing um, and found that it was really difficult um, to really find any resources um, about what I was looking at, um, how to identify anything. And within the last few years, those resources have really picked up. But um, initially, there was not much there. So um, I kind of just got into um, teaching myself as much as I could with what was available, and then went further and further down the rabbit hole. Um, so bees are extremely fascinating. In Oregon, we have um, 500 to 800 species. Um, and we have many, many bees that are out in the summer. So here in the Willamette Valley, we tend to have a lot of bees. Uh, in fact, probably the majority of our fauna out from February um, through June. Um, and that's really because that's when our biggest wildflower bloom is. Uh, but we still have a lot of species out um, from you know, the summer solstice all the way to October. Um, so we're going to look at some of those today. Um, and just kind of look at the diversity of these summer bees and then talk about ways that we can support them in our own spaces. Yes, so uh, just a really brief outline. Um, we're gonna start by looking at the social bees that we have and then the solitary bees and then the parasitic bees. And then we're going to look into uh, ways to supporting them. So the first, group of bees that we're going to look at are the bumblebees. And these are ones that we're probably all pretty familiar with. Um, this is really our dominant group of social bees. So the bumblebees establish new nests each season and they're different from the European honeybees in that manner. Uh, European honeybees often um, generally are colonial and have a nest that can last um, essentially indefinitely as long as the health of the colony remains stable. Um, I know of one wild hive that has been around for a dozen years or more. With our bumblebees though, they're always only annual um, colonies. Uh, so one queen in the spring, whenever she emerges, will go out and found a new colony. She'll uh, forage for her first batch of workers. And then the rest of the time she is in the nest while the workers do all the foraging. And they build up enough resources that they can start producing um, next year, or they can start producing reproductives, which will be next year's queens and males to mate with those queens before those queens go into hibernation for the winter. So in the Willamette Valley, we have um, uh, close to uh, 15 species of bumblebees. In Oregon as a whole, we have about two dozen. Um, and this is one of our uh, I think in some ways more of our summer bumblebees. This bumblebee only comes out, the queens only come out and start foraging really around um, kind of mid to late May and June. So if you're out right now, um, I see these in Alton Baker Park, um, the white shouldered bumblebee, you'll see the queens out right now. And this is one of our largest bumblebee species. This, the yellow faced bumblebee, Bombus vosnazinskii, is uh, one of our most common species here in the Willamette Valley pretty recognizable. They have one look-alike species that is very difficult to tell apart, um, but they're pretty recognizable and uh, really, really abundant here. So those are what we generally think of as our social species, but we also have social sweat bees. So bees in the family Holictidae, um, and particularly in the genus Holictus, are social. Um, and that means that like the bumblebees, you have a dominant female. In this case, it's not exactly a queen, um, but you have a dominant female and then you have worker bees that uh, provide for most of her young. Now, the main difference here is that the sweat bee worker bees are uh, also reproductively viable. So they can produce their own young. They just generally don't because a dominant female sort of um, it more or less intimidates them into not doing that and helping her raise her young. Um, however, in, in regions, particularly high elevations where the season is really short, um, these can sometimes uh, be solitary. So they can be social when the conditions are right or solitary when the conditions are um, uh, more amenable to a, just quickly pumping out um, next year's young um, areas when you may only have a month or two to forage. 
This is our really common sweat bee in the Willamette Valley, Helictus legatus. And if you look at its jawline, its cheek, it's really triangular. And that's actually a pretty good way to um, just identify these at a glance in the field. Now we're into the solitary species. This is Agapostemon femoratus. Um, this is a species we don't have in the Willamette Valley, but tend to see on the eastern side of Oregon, where we have a, a species Agapostemon texanus that looks almost exactly like this that we do see commonly in the Willamette Valley. And these are really common um, in urban areas, particularly um, around sunflower season. So they really love sunflowers. Um, and if you have sunflowers in your yard, uh, you're likely to see some of these metallic green sweat bees coming to visit. And we see these out from um, about May through uh, September, sometimes into early October. Um, and we'll see males out uh, particularly later in the season. This is a male Agapostemon varescens in my garden. And the males um, look a bit different than the females. They have quite a bit more yellow on them. So another group, now we're moving into a different, a different family. This is in the family Apidae. So that's uh, in the family that includes the bumblebees and honeybees. This is a Melisodes species or a summer longhorn bee. And these bees are called longhorn bees, particularly for the way the males look. So if we go back, the females um, don't have long antennae. Um, they're just kind of burly bees. They have really long brushes of pollen collecting hairs on the hind legs. Um, and they tend to really enjoy uh, flowers in the aster family. So again, you're going to see them at asters, sunflowers, um, and they can be quite abundant in urban areas. Uh, and I tend to see them in my yard predominantly from uh, kind of mid-July through September. So the males have really, really distinctive long antennae. And we have two uh, genera of longhorn bees in the Willamette Valley, we have Melisodes and we have Eucera. Eucera is really out um, from uh, March through about the middle of June, and then Melisodes takes over about the middle of June to uh, September. So um, in that area where they overlap, you can confuse them. You know, right now in June, um, you could find either, but once we hit about July and August, you're really only going to be finding Melisodes as the only longhorn bee. So if you see a, a male bee with antennae like that in July, um, you, you'll know it's a Melisodes. So in the same family, um, this is the Anthophora genus. Collectively, they're known as digger bees. Um, and this is a male Anthophora urbana. You can see an extremely long tongue. In fact, I couldn't fit the whole bee onto the screen here. And this is a female Anthophora urbana. So these are fairly common. Um, they tend to nest in aggregations. So um, when there's a really good nesting site, bees of one species or a couple species um, are going to really crowd that nesting site. And Anthophora are particularly well known for doing that. Um, so these bees probably nest uh, in large aggregations. So in some areas they're going to be um, really abundant. In other areas, you're not going to see them much at all. Um, but these tend to persist into uh, late July in our area. And now we're going to hop into a completely different family. So this is the family Megachylidae, which includes the leaf cutter bees and the mason bees um, and the wool carter bees. And we're gonna uh, talk about each of those uh, briefly here. So this is Megachyli inermis. This is a species of leaf cutter bee that is just giant. Um, so this bee here is about uh, a centimeter and a half long, so much larger than a honeybee. We're nearing bumblebee size here, queen bumblebee size here. And uh, they have really um, large uh, toothed mandibles that have razor sharp cutting edges in between the teeth, and that's to cut leaf material um, for building their nests. So these are bees that utilize leaf material to uh, line their nest cells. So they're cavity nesters like the mason bees. Um, and they line their nests with leaf material. Here's a male, uh, Megachyli, and the males are um, interesting in that 
some of them, and actually a fair number of species in our area, have really modified forelimbs. So if we look here, you can see the four tarsi, which are the, the segments at the bottom of the forelimb, are expanded and have this long fringe of hairs. And they uh, utilize that in mating. So um, during mating, the male will cover the female's eyes with that, um, with those front feet. And the idea behind that is it's likely a mate recognition thing. So the, uh, the exact form of those front feet um, is going to be really uh, species dependent. It's going to be different for each species and um, going to allow a certain amount of light in in certain areas. And so uh, the female can recognize it as a male of her own species. And these males also tend to be territorial. So they'll set up a territory around a um, flower patch, essentially, and one um, which is high in nectar and pollen resources. And they'll defend it from all other bees so that when a female of the same species comes in, the resources are really rich and she might spend more time there, which gives him more opportunities to mate. Uh, in the same family, we have the Horiades genus, and this is Horiades carinata. This is a male. Um, these are really tiny bees, and sort of for a reference of size here, um, these are the buds of goldenrod. So this bee is maybe about four millimeters. Um, these are really distinctive bees. They're really heavily pockmarked, and if you look closely, the abdomen on this male bee curves back under. So these are really, really distinctive bees um, and really interesting from a life history perspective. So these nest in cavities, again, like our leaf cutter bees and our mason bees, um, but what they use to line their nest cells is plant resins and sap. So in my yard and throughout the Eugene area, they tend to use uh, Douglas fir sap. So uh, if you find one of these nests, it's kind of a fun game of scratch and sniff where you can just scratch the, the nest seal um, and figure out what, um, what plant resins they're using. So on to the genus Amphidium. These are colloquially known as the wool carter bees. In the Willamette Valley, we have a really common one, and that's a European introduction. That's Amphidium monocotum, highly abundant um, across the region, and that was introduced into the California area accidentally only about 15 years ago and has moved up our way um, since that time. Really abundant here now, but we do have some native species. This is Amphidium utahensi. I found this uh, individual at Mount Pisgah Arboretum a couple years ago, and that was the first record of this species in the Willamette Valley in about 100 years. Um, so these are not common here, uh, but they definitely uh, do exist, and if we were to look for them more, we would probably find them in a lot more places. Um, it's unfortunate that the non-native species really outnumbers our native species, um, but if you provide the resources uh, that they need, provide the good habitat, um, you know, we might be able to boost back some of the numbers of these native species. Uh, these are really beautiful bees. Um, the vast majority of them, um, particularly in the males, are heavily marked with uh, pale white or yellow markings throughout the body. Um, and they're known as wool carter bees because the females shave woolly plant fibers off of stems and leaves um, to build their nests. So that's what they seal their nest cells with. And here's a uh, Anthidium mormonum female. So you can see again, uh, some of those same color patterns, really vibrant bees. This is a species we won't see in the Willamette Valley, but will be common um, east of the Cascades. And now we're moving into some of the parasitic bee species. So all of the um, bees that we just talked about have their own um, parasitic bee species that will parasitize their nests. So when we're talking about parasitic bees, we're talking about nest parasites. And they're colloquially known as cuckoo bees. Um, and what they do is they'll go into the existing nest of a bee and deposit an egg there. And that um, egg will hatch, develop into a larvae, and either the adult will have already killed the um, existing egg or larvae in there, or the um, cuckoo bee larvae will kill 
the um, host bee's egg or larvae. Um, and so then the, the pollen provision becomes the sole domain of that cuckoo bee. So they develop in the nests of other bees. Um, and a lot of people, you know, at first glance might think, well, these bees are bad then. Um, but the, the truth is actually um, the opposite. And there are a few reasons for that. So one of the reasons is that um, these kleptoparasitic cuckoo bees make up a huge amount of the diversity of bees globally. Um, they're also some of the rarest bees and they're some of the first to disappear in altered environments. So you're rarely going to find these bees in agricultural contexts. Um, they're kind of a, a canary in the coal mine um, in terms of how bee communities are doing. They also help to increase bee diversity by putting a limit on um, the most common bee species. So they limit the populations of the most common bee species by parasitizing their nests. And that allows for um, some of the less abundant bee species to increase their numbers because there are more resources available. So this is a common one that we have that's a nest parasite of leafcutter bees. Um, this is a Celioxus species. These are really, really distinctive. They have this long tapered abdomen with a sharp tip at the end. Um, this one, Stelis laticincta, uh, found this one in my yard. Um, they are parasites of some of the resin bees. So potentially that varieties bee, um, but also some of the leaf cutter bees that utilize resin. And then we have this Triepiola species, which is a nest parasite of um, the Melisodes and also some of the Anthophora. Um, so really every summer bee that we have is going to have its own um, group of parasites that may um, attack the nest. So how can you help bees in your space? Um, you're going to want to provide nesting, potentially. Um, so nest boxes are a really uh, great option. And uh, this is an example of some nest boxes I have in my yard. Um, and we can talk more about that, the, the, question, the question and answer period, because I do want to wrap up a little quickly now. Leaving bare ground for ground nesting bees is really important. And then avoiding tilling wherever possible because ground nesting bees don't nest that deep underground. So most tilling is going to disturb a nest. So if you can avoid tilling your garden um, whenever possible or rotating things, um, that's going to be very helpful for those ground nesting bees. Planting flowers that bloom in stages all the way through September is really important. So this is a photo from my yard. Um, and this is sort of a shade garden that we've worked in um, flowers that bloom from um, about March through, uh, through July. You wanna predominantly host or plant native plants. Um, and uh, Kelsey's gonna talk a lot more about that in just a moment. And then don't worry too much about lawn weeds, uh, particularly the lawn clovers that are really common weed in lawns are excellent bee forage. Um, here are just a couple more examples from my yard. So this is goldenrod, and this is a hedgerow that we planted alongside our vegetable gar garden. And um, we've also interplanted some native plants among our vegetables. And then there's a back alley there where I've um, done a pretty dense planting of uh, native plants. There's goldenrod, California poppies, self-heal. And then again, um, on the right, you can see more of that uh, planting in the vegetable garden where um, we have a lot of native plants along the sides um, providing forage um, and this really helps uh, potentially boost the vegetable crop as well by having um, these hedgerows in such close proximity to our um, vegetable garden. Um, so with that I'm going to wrap up and turn it over to uh, Kelsey to talk more about some of these native plants. And I'll stop my screen share here. Great. Thank you, August. That was very educational. I had, I knew we had a lot of bee species. Um, they had no idea about the, such diversity amongst all of those. Um, can I ask you real quick before we move on? Um, how, how many bee species do we have in Oregon as of right now? Last I heard it was around 500. Has that number gone up? 
Yeah, it's it's all just kind of an estimate at this point. Um, but 500 to 800 is is kind of a good estimate, wow. which is a huge range, right? But um, some of those uh, are going to be hard to to find and verify, and so that's part of what the Oregon Bee Atlas is working on. Great. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, we have a couple questions in the chat box. We'll get to those at the end. And I would like to introduce our next speaker for her virtual nursery tour. Um, Kelsey's with us today, Kelsey Irvine from the city of Eugene. And Kelsey manages Eugene's native plant nursery, which supports our park systems urban restoration projects with plants and seeds. Kelsey leads workly or not workly weekly volunteer work parties at the nursery and coordinates volunteer efforts um, amongst Eugene's many waterways with the goal of stewarding our waterways towards optimal health. And in her spare time, Kelsey also enjoys listening to storytelling podcasts, creating botanical illustrations, and singing in a local band. So thank you for being with us, Kelsey, and take it away with your tour. Thank you, Crystal. Good morning, everybody. Uh, the first thing I want to address is um, I envy August controlled environment. I am not in that situation right now with the opposite. So um, this is a little, it's an active corner right in the heart of Alton Baker Park in Eugene, where the Native Plant Nursery sits. Uh, it is right up against one of the city's community gardens and also um, an educational organization called Nearby Nature, which has thankfully been able to bring back youth camps this, this last week. Um, and I'm really happy for that and they're able to safely hang out together. But what that also means is some, uh, you might hear some yelling and some screaming, it's all in good fun, but it might interfere. We also have oats and pumping some beets over here. Wasn't sure of that. Um, so hopefully the audio is okay. I just want to say that we'll do our best. Um, so yeah, this is the City of Eugene's Native Plant Nursery. It's been uh, a lovely little corner of the world for me for, this will be my sixth season. And I thought I would just do like a program overview of the nursery and then we'd take a tour uh, and see some of the plants that our pollinators are pollinating and kind of why the nursery is here and why that's important to to it. And so, so the city of Eugene park system is a, is a vast amount of, of, of land acres. And so it's divided into a couple of ways. And one way it's divided is into natural areas. Uh, natural areas uh, consist of about 4,500 acres of our park system. And within those natural areas, there's a bunch of different habitats, such as oak savanna, there's upland prairie, there's the buttes, West Eugene wetlands, and then all the waterways. And associated with all those habitat types are is a team called Ecological Services, and which is comprised of different ecologists that specialize in those habitat types. So I work very closely with those folks because the nursery is supporting, um, as Crystal said, many our many uh, urban restoration projects. And at, at our current status, I believe there's about 45 active restoration projects within city limits, which is really unique. And uh, I think we should all be really proud of that here. Um, and the nursery might support anywhere from like six to 10 per year, depending on what phase of restoration that they're in. Uh, so the nursery is not growing trees and shrubs for the most part, because um, they are otherwise commercially available and we don't want to compete with local businesses. Um, but also um, the turnover rate is pretty, it takes a long time to get trees and shrubs out of a small nursery like this. And so instead we're focusing on annuals and perennials and forbs and rhizomes, things like that. Um, maybe maybe rare species or maybe species that are difficult to harvest or uh, care for in a larger setting, like a larger growing operation. Um, and we have a lot of specialized species too, like vernal pool species for the wetlands. And so basically what, how this all got started is um, it became clear that it was gonna be much more cost effective for us to be able to grow some of our own natives for these restoration projects. And uh, so this was started about 13 years ago and all, seed was either purchased by a local valley source or was collected on site of our various restoration projects and then they were the seed was brought here and we either grew them in uh, beds for seed production or many of them were seeded into pots which we call plugs which are little seedlings and that's the process that has continued so each year I work with the different ecologists and we decide what is needed in these different sites and if it's a new if it's a new bed for seed we take care of that with rotation or we might have to um, 
take a species out of production for a while in order to prioritize other species. And or the seed comes and we do we grow them in little plugs that live here for about three years and then they go back out on a site. So it's a really cool full circle uh, picture of restoration. Also, we're really interested in the DNA and uh, being pure to the valley and even more specifically pure to the habitat type. So we have three different beds of Iris Tanax here, meaning same genus and species, but one came from Spencer's Butte, one came from the West Virginia wetlands, and one came from Wild Iris Ridge. So three very different habitat types. So if we were interested in planting or seeding Iris Tanax, we would take a look at which habitat we were doing that at, and then we would pick from the proper seed source. So that's kind of how the nursery operates in general. I, I couldn't do this without the help of my volunteers, as Crystal mentioned. I do have a volunteer work party every Friday. Um, so if anyone's ever interested, please come on by. Uh, currently, it's going to be from 9 to noon through the summer, but the rest of the year it's from 1 to 4. And, um, and I just want to say thank you to all those volunteers, and also I have an assistant and some interns that help. But all of that was kind of put on the back burner for a while due to the pandemic. So as we walk through, we're going to see a few more weeds than I would have wanted you to see normally. <laughs> Um, so, really, August was able to give us the pollinators. Thank you, August, for that. This is sort of the other half of it, right? These are the plants that they're pollinating and for what purpose. And granted, food production is a main, a main reason that we care about um, pollination, but from an ecological perspective, we're really interested in um, restoring all of these spaces that provide, especially in an urban environment where pollution is really high and um, otherwise, uh, ornamentals can come into play, which are also good for pollinators, but having a native nursery and then uh, urban restoration projects is really helpful in continuing the corridor that the pollinators can, can uh, go through, uh, extending out through the valley, and then hopefully encouraging you know, optimal habitat health. So we're going to walk through some of these. Although they're grown in monoculture beds, I think just having this many beds, we have 36 just behind me here. This many beds with different species in it is also a really diverse habitat in and of itself. And being right next to the community garden, which has food plants and ornamental plants, is really a great place for pollinators to come and do their thing. So um, I won't work too much. I don't want anything to get crazy. The first one we're going to stop at is actually right here. The species is no longer in bloom, as you can see. Um, this is Sedelsia brigata marmoflora, and it's the rose checker mallow. It's really common in a bunch of our restoration sites, particularly in the West Virginia wetlands. Um, there is a lot of grass, uh, non, you know, purposeful grass in here right now, but I'm not going to pull it because the plant has gone to seed, and if I were to pull, I could dishevel the seed. Because what we're, our goal really is, is to get at is to get at all of the seed that comes from the plants. Um, our yield here is important to us so that we can make sure to continue to support all the different projects that, are, that this plant um, can be at. It's a really great, sorry, I'm gonna do this. <laughs> it's a really great uh, nectar source for one of our endangered species, which is the feathers blue butterfly. Uh, so this is gonna always, pretty much always be a plant that we're gonna uh, put out onto our various sites. And then as we go down just a couple of beds, and I trip over things in the walkway, um, this bed right here, this is Hall's Aster. It's a summer blooming uh, plant. You can see that just a small pocket here has begun to bloom. Uh, this is a very versatile plant. It can go on many sites, and although it spreads really well by rhizome uh, and grows really easily in most settings, it is a very difficult plant to harvest seed from, and it also happens to be one of the most valuable seed that there is. So this is about $1,400 a pound um, if we were to have to purchase it. And so we have three beds of aster here, and that'll just give you an, a sort of a reveal how important it is to us. Um, and the reason it's difficult to harvest is because it, in the aster family, like a dandelion, it puts on like a, a little puffball seed um, that blows away in the wind really, really easily. So it's hard to collect by hand. So what we do here, at least in a larger setting, right? Um, what we do here is we take shop backs and we basically, we just vacuum all the seed heads off and that's how we collect. And it's proved to be really efficient. Um, however, even though the bed looks sort of small at four by 16, 
it can take up to three hours to harvest up only one bed. And as I said, we have three of them. Um, but it has been really effective, as I said, and we were able to get 10 pounds last year versus um, a, a different group that had a much larger swath. It was about a quarter acre. Because it's so difficult to harvest effectively on a large scale, like I said, um, they were really only able to get about two pounds. So we felt pretty good about our yield with this Plant. And it does spread well, as I said, and that's what's in the walk right here. And I'm just going to transplant them. I, I don't want to pull them out just, just yet. So we're just going to kind of slowly walk back. And as we do, because we're getting into summer, a lot of the beds are not blooming as they were even a few weeks ago, where you could see a whole lot of activity with pollinators. Um, but as we go through, you'll notice probably different uh, floral structures and that's important to recognize because different pollinators will want will be attracted to and be most effective on different kinds of floral structures things like aster that we just went by is a wide open flower um, but then we have things like lupin that have a real closed flower and therefore specialized um, mechanisms are needed for pollinators to get in and pollinate those plants um, we are lucky to have had pollinator palaces built here and I'm going to take you over to one of those now. This is a volunteer designed and built um, project and so thank you Jody and Ross. Uh, we have two of them here. There's one at the, at the front of the nursery that is next to the nearby nature uh, landscape and then we have one right back here and we're kind of slowly making our way there. These are in support of many pollinators. So we spoke a lot about bees, um, but also we have moths and butterflies and then parasitic wasps that come through here that are really helpful in, um, in pest management. Like uh, parasitic wasps, uh, one year basically took out a whole swath of aphids for me that was trying to destroy our lupin beds. So that was really great. So this is our palace. There's not a ton of activity in there right now, obviously, just probably because it's cool out and the time of day. Um, but I'm gonna open it because one of the coolest parts is that volunteers built it so that we could look into the depths of what was happening what we do know is on this top row here, we have a parasitic wasp that then mason bees nested in front of. And so we've been watching that with interest. We're not quite sure who's gonna win out there. But this has been really active all um, season as is the one at the front of the nursery. This area here was an active bumblebee nest, which we did not expect. Um, and so uh, it, got, it got quite quite a lot of activity, as you can see. And earlier in the season, if you walked by here, there was a good 10 or 15 that would be floating around that bumblebee nest. So moving on, I'm just going to kind of take you back into the middle of the beds and we'll walk backwards. If you have any questions about specific species that we might walk by that I don't talk about, please feel free to ask me about any of them uh, at the end. We have, a, like I said, there's all different kinds of habitats that we're supporting. So we have all different kinds of plants and we have spring through fall bloomers. Um, right now, what's blooming is, so the aster's just starting and this right here is Achillea millifolium. So this is yarrow, many people might be familiar. And yet again, a very different floral structure where it's you know, a wide open umbel. And so a variety of pollinators will be able to get onto that. The seed in this case, you saw a seed that I held in my hand that you could see. The seed in this case is so small um, that you may not be able to see it if I were to show it to you without like a much, a much better zoom. So we have all different kinds of ways that we have to harvest seed and, and all kinds of sizes and weights that they, that they come in. Um, different ways of cleaning down the material. So even though you might collect a seed pod, you then have to open that pod and get seed down to pure uh, seeds. There's no plant material around it, which we call chaff. 
each of these species has a unique way in which you have to clean it. You even use things like softballs and, you know, we have different machines that help separate all of this. It's been, it's been interesting to come up with different ways to get them cleaned down to pure seed. And I mentioned using a shop back earlier, but we use other interesting ways of harvesting the seeds that thankfully has been pollinated by our natives, um, such as on a lupin bed, for example, we use uh, nylons to put over the inflorescence as the seed is becoming ripe so that they still got air and water but pop open because they irregularly pop open um, into something that would then catch it. So we put the nylons over top and then tied them at the bottom. There's all kinds of interesting ways that, that we try to, try to harvest effectively and efficiently. Um, there's uh, different families here, all kinds of different families, but we have a number of Fabaceae family plants here. Uh, Fabaceae are nitrogen fixing, it's the pea family. And so we have a couple of different lotus, we have the lupin. So those things are important to put on a restoration site for that aspect, let alone the pollinating aspect. So that's something that we pay attention to too. We're coming up to Oregon sunshine. This is a beautiful summer blooming plant. Again, um, it, aster family, so it's a wide open flower, easy to walk around. You see a lot of bumblebees and bees on this plant. Um, what's kind of cool is when you see bees floating around and pollinating different plants, you'll see their little pollen sacs on them. And oftentimes they're yellow, um, just because generally speaking, pollen is yellow. We have a plant just behind me here. And again, it's, it's not as dense of a bed as I would normally want to have. But you can still see, this is Gilia. This is Gilia capitata. It's more of an upland, kind of dry, rocky soil plant. Uh, but when you see the bumblebees going around it, pollinating it, their little the sacks are blue in, in that case. It's really, really pretty cute. And I want to get a good picture someday. Um, so it, versus the, the yellow that I was saying before, it's kind of a unique thing. And we we're hoping that maybe there would be some flying around today, but so far I haven't seen any. I think it'll probably be later when, again, when we warm up. This is uh, one of the other aster beds. This is the oldest bed, not, well, this is California poppy. It's not supposed to be here, but that's kind of okay. Like sometimes I let certain things grow here that are non-native. Uh, sunflowers being one of my favorites. So you'll see sunflowers, like when sunflowers pop up or the, or the red poppies sometimes that come through the community garden. There's a few things that I'll let stay just because, well, one, they're fine for pollinators and two, they're, they're pretty. <laughs> but I don't let them spread throughout the nursery too much. We're going past our camas bed. So this is camas linea. This is the tall camas. And as you can see, it has uh, completed its bloom cycle and now it's gone into, into seed. Um, this is a, a really, a large, a large seed. This is uh, one that's that's quite easy to clean in compar to, comparison to some of the other smaller things. Camas is interesting because it takes, it could take up to seven years for it to bloom from seed. So we do seed it out on restoration projects often, but uh, we don't have an expectation of seeing much for blooming or seeing a population develop for quite some time. We're getting kind of into the back area here and I say that because it's the one that I let go a little more wild than some of the other spots. For example, we're gonna come up to an area just behind me here that there's a bed of Madia elegans, which is a lovely, um, tall, yellow blooming. One has just begun to bloom behind me there. Um, they open in the morning and then they close in the afternoon. Uh, it tends to like to seed itself better in the walkways than in the bed, so <laughs> I just figure, so I don't lose yield, I'll let them grow in the walkway and then just try and reseed the bed each year. So we try to be a little innovative about how we're allowing some of these things to grow. Um, we're getting kind of close to the, to the end here. I don't want to walk too much through that portion, but stepping by, here's, here's another one. This is Lomatium uh, nudicali. Um, it is just now beginning to put on its seed. The seed is forming. And it's interesting because you can see where some were not pollinated. Uh, these have been pollinated, but just below where I'm standing, uh, these were not because there's no seed forming. So it's kind of interesting to think about why, um, and maybe it was 
it could be a variety of things. It could have been environment. It could have been um, like where they were on the plant as opposed to another maybe taller, more obvious blooming uh, stem. Could have been, uh, you know, a couple different things. We're not quite sure. It's always interesting though, like I said, to kind of, you know, analyze all the different things that happen here at the nursery. Each year I do this, I think I figured it out. And each year I'm completely wrong. Like some, something I thought I was sure about changed yet again. So it's been a really amazing experience. And I think it's really a unique program. Um, again, I would like people to come here all times of year so that you can see all the spring blooming flowers and the different options that you could potentially have in your own spaces that are native, that would support native pollinators, but then summer and fall as well. Um, I feel like I, so I did mention a little bit about the, the seeding into pots for plugs, but I don't know that I'm gonna walk us over to the shade houses right now, but just consider that that's also an ongoing process here. And then lastly, we do have about 15 10 by 10 beds that are in the ground outside of our fence area here that are all rhizomatous species. And each of those have a, a bloom cycle that needs support from pollinators as well. And even though you can come as a project manager and dig up a rhizomatous species and just put a root fragment at your restoration site and have it be successful, we also like to collect the seed because that's another way to support those projects. So I think with that, um, I will go back to Crystal because um, I think going back any farther is probably not going to be necessarily that effective. So again, thank you so much for everyone uh, joining us today for the tour. And again, if you have any more questions, we'll, we'll address them next. Great. Thank you so much, Kelsey. I learned a lot about the native plant nursery just now. And I would like to, I would like to point out to everybody watching, um, when you come to volunteer at Kelsey's next work party, um, don't, don't rub those bees the wrong way um, over in that pollinator house. I, I made the mistake of doing that and they will, they will sting you if you upset them. So there's that. <laughs> um, we have got some really awesome questions that I would love to get into right now. And I think I'll just go down the list from what we have in our chat box. Um, and our first question is to you, August, and Kelsey, feel free to chime in also. Our first question is, August, what are your favorite bee plants blooming right now? Um, right now, uh, we're starting to get into some of the um some of the asters the aster family members that are out um, for a lot of the summer so um goldenrod i saw in, in a couple of my photos um and douglas aster i really really love um those are beneficial to both generalist foraging bee species and specialists so we have a number of bees that specialize on aster pollen um and then outside of the Willamette Valley area. Um, this is more of a higher elevation and or east side plant, but um, anything in the genus Facelia um, is really, really fantastic. Um, so those are great that are blooming right now. And then I like the California poppies a lot too. Um, so those uh, provide only pollen, no nectar. So they're really built for bees that are out foraging for pollen right now. So those are really great for supporting some of the um, worker bumblebee populations. Um, those are probably my tops right now. Oh, wait, one more, I just remembered. Ocean spray. Um, that's a really gorgeous large shrub um, in the rose family. And that just attracts um, hundreds of species of bees and wasps and flies and butterflies. Um, really fantastic right now. Wow, great. Thanks. I always forget about ocean spray too, and that is such a great <laughs> one. So thanks for the reminder, August. Um, Kelsey, do you, would you like to chime in with some of your favorite blooms right now? Sure. Well, I echo what uh, August said, and interestingly enough, I did a phenology report once on ocean spray, and it did definitely become one of my favorite uh, shrubs. Um, he showed 
photos earlier of Soledago in his garden. I would say that's a, a really great blooming uh, one right now. Um, again, the, the Areophyllum, uh, we also have Clarkia bloom, blooming right now. I didn't necessarily focus on each plant that was blooming, um, but those are, the Clarkia is an annual, but it's a lovely little annual that attracts all kinds of uh, pollinators. Um, and I'm just, and yeah, I think that's a good, that's a good handful, you know, five, six, seven. Great. Thank you, Kelsey. Our next question comes from Joseph. And Joseph says that they had ground nesters under a tree last year, but have not seen them return. They assumed they were hibernating, but nothing so far. Could they have disappeared or been wiped out somehow, or maybe just moved location? Um, August, do you have any thoughts on Joseph's issue with ground nesters? Um, so all of that is still a possibility. Uh, depends on when you saw them last year. Um, if you saw them, you know, around this time last year, then they should be coming out around now. Um, the thing is, we've had a really interesting June where we got quite a bit cooler and wetter. So things have been delayed a bit that we last year would have seen um, by now. So um, if, if we're still in the area when you saw them last year, they may still come out. But the other things you mentioned are a possibility as well. So sometimes you do just get um, small die-offs of a population where um, just a, a, a parasite load got too large, you had a viral outbreak, a fungal outbreak, all of those things happen um, really normally in bee nests. Um, so that's a possibility too. Um, and then the other thing is often, often before that happens, um, there's sort of this slow buildup of an increase in bee numbers, and some of those move on to other places. So they may have moved down the block, and then a couple of years from now, they're going to come back. So all of that is within the realm of possibility. Wow. Thanks for that, August. Uh, these bees have a lot going on that they need to, we need to protect them from. Um, our next question is for you, Kelsey. Alexander asks about the pollinator palace. Is the cage around the pollinator palace to keep sap suckers from eating mason bee larvae? Yep, exactly. And I should have mentioned that. Thanks for bringing it up. Yep, it was for protection um, uh, from predation. Absolutely. And uh, I thought it unique the way that they designed that because really it's a dish rack <laughs> that then they <laughs> were innovative with and made as a very, you know, protective cage. So. That's so clever. I never would have thought to use a dish rack as yeah. a cage to protect bee larvae. Great. Um, so our next question is for you also, Kelsey. Alyssa asks, how often do you change out the plants that are grown in the beds at the native plant nursery? Sure, thanks for the question. Um, annual species, so that's just species that, that live one cycle, one year. We switch out every three to five years, depending on their production. The perennial species, for the most part, unless we are not actively using the seed, will keep in the bed for as long as, as, as they do well. Um, we, if a perennial species starts to fail and it's a really dense bed, one example, again, um, was aster, but also iris, uh, we thin them and then either put those thin thin plant materials in pots, maybe we give them to a project, or maybe we start another bed. Often that will help rejuvenate the perennial bud. Um, so, so generally, if, as long as they're doing well, the perennials stay, but the annuals are every three to five years. And then, like I said, sometimes we just stop using a species for whatever reason, maybe it's just not the right phase in the restoration project that it was intended for, but that's when we'll do assessments and decide whether to bring in a brand new species. Uh, just this last year, we built five new beds and added uh, three kids' waiting pools, that's really what they are, to um, start growing vernal pool species and some species that we ran out of space for. So we're also al always expanding. Nice. Thank you. Um, so we have one more question, and I'd kind of like to build on Qu Kim's question a little bit. Kim asks, where is this place located? And I'd also like to ask you to share with us, um, in addition to where it's located, when you do these weekly work parties and how interested people can connect with you to learn more about uh, helping you volunteer out there. 
Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is it's kind of hard to describe, but it's in Alton Baker Park. If you were to come in the main entrance off of MLK Junior Boulevard, uh, you go past the parking lots that live in either side of you. You're parallel to the river and the road forces you to go left. You'll see a sign for the native plant nursery and for nearby nature pointing you that direction. You cruise down past the Cuthbert, which will be on your left. Community garden comes up on your right. And then on the corner is the host house and the road forces you to take a right there. And you come down a little ways and there's also network charter school classroom here that operates out of here. And it's a, there's a big yurt and right at that yurt, there's a driveway and that's where you can come in. The nursery isn't open unless I'm here, my assistant is here, um, but we often are at this point, I'm here most afternoons uh, because my job requirements changed a little with the pandemic. Um, and we're doing a little less with waterways and, and volunteerism on waterways and, and I'm able to focus a little more on operations here. So I'm here more often than I ever have been. Um, but if it's locked, that's because no one's here. Otherwise, certainly we're always here on Fridays. And as I mentioned, typically we're 1 to 4 p.m. on Fridays. But in the summer when it gets hot, it's much more comfortable to be here in the morning. So we're here 9 to noon starting tomorrow through probably September 1st. And... Uh, uh, you know, we do have a variety of activities. So some of the things that are, are regular grounds maintenance, of course. Um, so that basically means weeding and pruning, but also certainly now more than, uh, and going into the next couple of months, it's full seed collection. Um, so using some of those methods I mentioned, such as, you know, vacuums, but other things too, to collect seed. And then going into fall, it gets into seeding flats, transplanting, and then cleaning down seed. Um, so there's always a different activity. I try to make sure to vary it up for people and certainly people have different interests and reasons to want to be here. So we want to make sure to, to, um, to coordinate with folks on those. Um, I did see the question about parking. Uh, it's, it's, you can park at the community garden as you come up to it. There's usually plenty of space. Um, and then uh, I'm, I'm working on trying to get some parking a little bit more close to the nursery, but we do have, it's like I said, it's an active kind of packed little corner. So if there isn't spots at the community garden, you're welcome to come to the nursery and then we can discuss where is a better location. I hope that helps. <laughs> we love to see you. <laughs> Great, thank you. I love a visit to the native plant nursery. And that raises one more question from me. August, do you ever lead work parties or workshops or engage with volunteers in any way out at Mount Pisgah or in other places of the state that you'd like to share with us? Sure, yeah, uh, Mount Pisgah Arboretum hosts um, work parties. It's a little different right now with everything that's going on with the pandemic. Um, so uh, it's kind of a call and reserve your, your um, it's call and schedule ahead of time, basically a small group work party if you wanna do that. Um, but generally speaking, we have some weekly work parties um, and then we're also often hosting walks and workshops um, on various topics uh, at the Arboretum. Those are on hold right now as well. Um, but in normal times, yeah, uh, and I do some bee identification workshops um, and have done some of those around the state and was going to be doing a, a whole um, session on Steens Mountain in August, but that's been canceled. So um, next year, hopefully, <laughs> we'll be doing more things like that. I would love to go on and on and learn about Steens Mountain and pollinators, um, but we do need to wrap up in a minute. Um, and we have one last question from Kim that wonders if any of these awesome native plants are for sale at Pisgah or Native Plant Nursery. Um, so the city's Native Plant Nursery, uh, there, there, is, there is not anything for sale. Um, it's all contracted to the restoration projects. Um, out, at, out, out at Mount Pisgah, they have a large native plant nursery. I actually interned there and got to know folks out there well, and um, I love it out there. It's amazing. They have an annual plant sale, which is typically held in May, but August, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they were doing, they were doing online sales for an extended period of time right now during the pandemic, given the circumstances. So you can, at least at times of year, purchase plants from Pisgah, but unfortunately, yeah. no, uh, not things here. Yeah, and I, you can look it up. I, want to say that the plant sale, the online plant sale is wrapped up right now, but I could be wrong. It's wrapping up soon and they may do another one later on. Um, but uh, yeah. 
there's a great, there's a couple of good native plant nurseries though. Like Doat Creek is one of them that I mm -hmm. mostly send people to. Um, and then Willamette Wildlings is a little place out of Cresswell. Uh, Sherry, who owns that, she used to, this used to be her position here at the native plant nursery. And also um, she and I uh, connected in, in ways when I was uh, buying plants for garden centers. So I was able to bring in a bunch of product for, for that and see it and it's really excellent. So those are two to maybe look great awesome well i think that about wraps us up and we have one minute so if y'all have any final words that you'd like to share with our attendees